Welcome, everybody. This is the U.S. Great Sports Podcast. I'm Doug Barry, along with Father Richard Holland, my good friend. We've got Father Bill Peckman with us tonight. This is going to be yeah. fantastic. New book coming out, and we're going to be talking about A Young Catholic's Guide to Spiritual Warfare, which any of us who are parents knows that's something we're concerned about for our kids, that they understand the importance of spiritual warfare. Of course, everything begins with prayer, as we always like to say, and we always like to do. And Father Heilman, I pass that off to you. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you very much, Father. All right, before we get started, I always want to give a big shout out and a big thanks to everybody out there who supports the U.S. Grace Force and what we're trying to do here with this podcast. We are on YouTube. We are setting up on Rumble, so be looking out for that. We're getting all those pieces in place. And we are on Podbean. And if you go to the usgraceforce.com, you can scroll down to the bottom of any of the podcast pages and see the six different audio platforms that we're on. Please, please do that. Please share this with as many people as possible. We really want to get this information out to as many as possible so we can all have a better grasp of really living our faith and really fighting the good fight. And also don't forget, if you'd like to support us financially, the great, great people out there who've been helping us with the Patreon program, you can click the link in the description below. Go on out, prayerfully consider by taking a look at that, whether or not you feel it's something you'd like to do to help us with a few dollars a month or more. And that always is a tremendous, tremendous assistance to getting this message out. Also, please don't forget the official U.S. Grace Force gear page. T-shirts are out there, all kinds of great shirts, all kinds of hoodies, long sleeve, short sleeve, women's styles, men's styles. The whole bucket of enchiladas is out there. Just imagine a bucket of enchiladas if you can. That's what you get when you go to the U.S. Grace Force gear page. So please check that out. Father, we have one of your old friends. I know you two have worked together on the famous Let Freedom Ring book, right. which has been a tremendous help to a lot of people, thanks be to God. But we got something new tonight. So I will let you introduce our guest and tell us what we're in for tonight. So I've known Father Bill for a few years now and only through social media. And we keep saying, we've got to get together personally someday. Of course, we worked on that book, as you mentioned, Let Freedom Ring with Father Altman. And uh, it's the best book I've ever uh, I've ever seen in my life. Although it's about be, to be challenged because Father Bill Peckman has just written an amazing book. Um, it, he he's been telling me about it and sharing uh, portions of it with me all along as he's been writing it, and it's just going into print or or just finished going into print, and uh, is now available. So we want to talk about that tonight. But before we get to Father Bill Peckman, I just want to. Uh, uh, trumpet, you know, all the good work that he does. Of course, he's got, you're, you're the pastor of like 83 parishes right now, isn't it? Uh, Father Bill? He's got, and counting. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing what you're doing there. And then, but, um, you know, you and I, uh, and, but uh, you, you use social media because it gets um, to a wider audience and we're in a battle. Uh, we, we've got to get truth out and we've got to teach uh, because uh, our our poor faithful are are being indoctrinated, they're they're being lied to, and uh, and you know they're trying to establish all these new norms and new normals, and all this stuff. And and Father Peckman's writings, if you have not read his writings, it's just it's unbelievable. And I'm not just saying that because um, we're on the air tonight and he's here. Uh, I truly have been amazed. I can't. Every time I see him put something up, I I just, I'm, I just oh I got I got to read this I got to read this, and and it's always at the just the right length too. You're good at that too. <laughs> it's uh it's never too long, never too short, and but it's always extremely profound. But uh, you've had this idea, and uh, obviously I we we both believe that well three believe this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. But I think it's an incredible idea, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you tell us what this is all about and how it came to be and all that good stuff, Father. Okay. Well, this book has been years in the making. Yep. And it comes from two or three different sources. One of them is within my life, uh, my own prayer life, my own life as a priest, uh, an understanding how spiritual warfare takes place. You know, I point out in the introduction that in the seminary, and I'm pretty sure it's probably the same with you, we never heard those words. Um, 
Right. It wasn't as if we denied that there was a devil or hell or demonic or temptation. It was just never talked about. Right. Um, and, and then slightly touched on when we talked about the sacrament of confession. Yep. Um, I grew up, my dad was very much um, aware and pushed with myself and my siblings that the devil was real, that temptation was real, and that we had an obligation to fight mm-hmm. and to um, use the grace God gave us to fight temptation day in, day out. And then in the course of my priesthood in a couple of different ways, one is... Um, I've seen the demonic up close and personal. I'm not an exorcist, but I've seen it up close and personal um, on several occasions. One being very notable when my church was desecrated uh, back five, six years ago. Um, and there was a lot going on there. And then, um, and part of it, it is also the work I've done with high school students for 20 years now. Yeah. That... There seems to be a lot of confusion on their part of what is sin, what's not sin, um, you know, temptation, and then the constant drubbing they get from the secular world on, you know, who they are as a person, um, what's sinful, what's not sinful, and the big lies they get told on a regular basis. And in conversations I've had with them and working with the camp that I work with, um, just this kind of understanding that we don't know how to identify this stuff. We don't know how to fight it. We know it's there, even though people tell us it's not there. And so those things all kind of gelled together. And I think Let Freedom Ring just kind of pushed it all over the edge. That um, mm-hmm. it was time to take this more seriously. Let Freedom Ring was more aimed at adults. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I kept looking at Let Freedom Ring and think, thought, okay, how do we put this into a language and constructs that a high school or a college student would understand? And I took it from the vantage point that they were completely uncatechized. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in the first chapters, I talk about the reality of the devil, the reality of sin, mortal sin, what it does, um, and just tried to kind of answer those questions I've heard over the years from high school students and college students in particular and how to approach all of this. Because they're not hearing about spiritual warfare at their parishes. They're not hearing about spiritual warfare in their classes, regardless of what academic level they're at. They're Mm -hmm. just not hearing about it. But they have a sense that something's going on. They don't know what to call it and how to fight it. So that's where this book kind of germinated. Father, I'm curious, you you know, go back to Let Freedom Ring, the feedback, what feedback did actually both of you, because I heard amazing feedback from it, but just out of curiosity, what what were people finding in Let Freedom Ring that was really resonating? Uh, Because as you both mentioned, you know, and you said, Father Peckman, I know Father Hallman, you've talked this about this, that even in the seminary, this key piece was not really emphasized or formed. And, you know, one of our uh, podcasts, our Grace Force podcast friends, Dan Schneider, talks about when he'll travel sometimes to places and do formation for priests, they will talk about how they've gotten some theological formation, but they didn't get any real spiritual combat formation. They didn't get any real how to deal with diabolical sorts of, of level, different levels of diabolical activity and problems. But Let Freedom Ring did seem to, at least the people I heard from, really impact people in some of those ways. So starting with you, Father Peckman, what what kind of feedback did you hear that really showed that it was resonating and how with people? The general comment I heard over and over again, and I don't know if uh, Father Hallman heard the same thing, is we never hear these things talked about. Right. You know, and it was so refreshing for so many people to hear these things talked about And not just talk about as a museum piece, but as these are active in your life, here is how to combat it. And they were not getting that from very many places. And again, if the seminary hasn't, you know, taught priests that for decades, and it has been decades, and it's not because, I just want to make this point, it's not because it's not in the catechism, and it's not in the scriptures, it is. 
you know, I, I drew a lot of those things and quoted from them in the book itself to make sure that people didn't think that, you know, I, I, dig, I, I dug up something from the 12th century and said here that the church still very much sees these things, believes these things, but it's like a lot of other things, it's not getting caught for whatever reason. Yeah. And, and, and we're living in a uh, climate right now of censorship and uh, you're not allowed to talk about these things. So uh, that was refreshing. I heard from a lot of people where, you know, I think in, in our, you know, quiet little circles, you know, we whisper about, you know, what the, what the devil's doing and, you know, through, through the culture, through, through uh, politicians and, you know, through all kinds of ways. Uh, but we're not allowed to talk about these things. And uh, I've, a lot of people just felt like it was, it opened a door and, and said, you know, okay, let's be honest about what's going on in the world right now. And I think that's what we, we really tried to focus on, the three priests. Uh, the, we tried to mansplain. <laughs> I, I keep saying, call, uh, Altman, Peckman, Heilman. <laughs> but anyways, we, uh, we, we tried to, to help us to understand, okay, here's what the devil's doing. Because uh, I, I know you feel the same way, Father, but uh, we're called shepherds as, as uh, priests. And uh, what does a shepherd do? But he keeps his eye out for uh, any any uh, predators, you know, the the wolves or whatever that are that are uh, looking to uh, devour the sheep. And that's almost like his primary role. You feed the sheep and you watch over them. You watch over the sheep and watch over them means you keep you keep your eye out on predators. And I felt that like that's what we were doing is saying, okay, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, and uh, here's in. And I think too we were pushing back on this uh, this this um, uh, way in which uh, you know you twist the truth or you just flat out lie, and to to establish these new normals, as I said earlier. And uh, we we I think we did our best to try to say no 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 no, uh, these are not new normals. There never will be new normals. We shouldn't buy into that lie. And and I think uh, a lot of people commented that that way that it was good that we're staying true to our Lord, true to the word of God and, and true to truth. And, uh, and so uh, I, I love, I love that book. Mm. I mean, I, I feel like I'm bragging when I say that because, because I'm a third of the book, but I just love that book. I really do. And uh, so let freedom ring, pick it up. <laughs> well, and I have a question also for both of you too, being that you're both <clears throat> very willing and very open and very much involved with spiritual warfare with your parishioners. What types of things are you finding? I mean, generally speaking, of course, um, with young people and, their, and the difficulty that they're having understanding spiritual warfare. I mean, there's so much out there going on on so many different levels. We're indoctrinated with social media. We're indoctrinated, and not just with the bad stuff in social media, but just social media itself is one example. It's excessive. Um, you know, I would say we also, we strive to live in this climate-controlled world where we want everything comfortable and easy. And these things can be used against us, as we've we heard from, you know, Father Ripperger and others who deal with this on that level. But what do you two see, you know, in the confessional? Obviously, you're not going to tell us about the confessions, obviously. But in general, what are our young people really struggling with? You know, and Father Peckman, since you wrote this book on this, that, you know, parents out there, it, this has to resonate with parents. I would think parents would be incredibly excited about a book like this because right. we are concerned about our kids. Um, and a lot of parents don't even know what's going on. But what are you finding out there that young people are dealing with in the spiritual realm, spiritual warfare realm? What I'm finding is they have bought a lot of what I term in the book um, that I wrote, The Big Lie. Yep. And so, for example, I, seven of the chapters are the seven deadly sins. And at the very beginning, I say what the big lie is with that sin. So, for example, with pride, the big lie, and we see this over and over again, is that you can um, put together an identity that is fulfilling, that is independent of God. And we see this more and more in just how wild and irrational self-identification has become in this country. That truth is what I make it. Yep. And then, you know, under lust, for example, that you're nothing more than an animal. Therefore, you know, whatever trickles through your brain must be the truth. Yep. 
And right. so for them, they don't know really the difference between objective and subjective truth. And they kind of treat everything as subjective. Mm. So part of the book arose also, I've been teaching in my eighth grade class for a couple of years, a, like an eight class, um, class on analytical thinking. So that, you know, we take apart these big lies and start saying, okay, let's expose them for what they are. Because the big lie is what, how Satan will always frame his temptations. And, you know, and essentially the one where I said in private, you can form an identity that is fulfilling dependent, independent of God, that's Eden. That is the first temptation. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, that's so awesome, Father. And I'm so grateful that you're doing this. You know, you look at youth. And Jesus said, he pulled the child over. He said, unless you become like this child, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And, you know, there's probably many interpretations to that. The one that I stand on is that uh, uh, children and youth uh, are trusting of their mentors, of, of, of people who tell them things. And so they learn quick. You know, I say, look at a two-year-old learns a whole language. I'm a six years old. I can't learn Latin. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks because us old dogs uh, have been lied to so many times that we're suspicious of our teachers. Uh, the, the youth, not so much yet. They haven't been, uh, they haven't been uh, betrayed uh, enough to let that happen. And so, uh, so they're easy pickings, if you, if you know what I mean. And uh, the, the, there's a preciousness in their, um, their uh, confidence in their teachers. And that's amazing. And I think that, you know, I, again, that's what I think Jesus was saying, that, you know, let go of your pride and, and uh, you know, let, let yourself be taught. You know, let, uh, but uh, be humble, in other words. And so there's that aspect of it. But if not careful, you know, these, these young people can be easily swayed because they're going, okay, well, you know, if the government says that, the government, you know, they can't be wrong, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I look back on uh, the church after the council, and there were, I think, in my interpretation is the progressives took over. And, you know, you look at the Catholics at that time, for sure, they were like, okay, well, Father says this, it's, it's dogma, you know, it's got to be right. There was a high trust of teachers. And I think that's the same with youth. And I think what you just said there, Father, is so important that we have to help them to, understand, to discern uh, what's, what's truth and what's false and, and to not just buy a, any lie that comes their way. Is that, is that am, am, I, am I close to what you're talking about there? You're dead on. Okay. <laughs> Good. And part of it is there are inundated in the culture that is corrupt from yeah. So, you know, and I, I think it was the chapter on lust. Um, the editor and I, went back and forth on a particular song that was popular back in 2020. It was the number one song, and it is unex- unadulterated filth from stem to stern, oh. using language that I never thought I would hear on the radio. And I remember this last summer, we were talking to a group of um, my high school students here, and you know everybody knows what the song is, and I, it's so filthy, I don't want to say its title. Because the title itself is filthy. And the kids were surprised that there was something wrong with that song. Like, oh, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> How much obvious, more obvious do things have to get? Right. And, you know, myself and the vocational director kind of went into a whole thing, why this is wrong. And, and we're wondering, why at this juncture have these high school students not you know, you want to talk about trusting, they'll pick up what's on the radio and think, well, it's been on the radio, it must be right. Yeah, yeah, and it's got to be true if it's on the radio. If it's on CNN, yeah. it's got to be true, you know. And <laughs> it's gotten so bad and so obvious anymore. You know, I, I don't think the devil's even making the the effort to cloak himself anymore. Right. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be nearly the so-called subtlety that there was in the past regarding some of these things. There very much in your face. And, and I, you know, I, I, it's when I've had talks with parents, you know, and you bring up even birth control and, you know, parents will say to me sometimes afterwards, they'll come, if I'm speaking at a church or a conference, they'll come to the table later where 
and I've got materials to offer and they'll come over and someone comes up inevitably and says, is, is it, is that true? Is birth control really wrong? Is I there a problem with birth control? And you know, my, my, my heard this, or I heard that I heard a priest say that it was okay for, for me and my husband or whatever, you know, just that the idea of it rarely gets talked about number one. And when it does, it isn't talked about correctly, you know, uh, in, in many respects, um, I'm curious, Father Peckman, then, you know, so many parents right now are probably thinking, okay, so what do we do? They know their kids have, you know, you described this, you know, obviously this kind of more relativistic idea that, you know, I can have this relationship apart from God. I can find value and truth and these things in life apart from God, which is ridiculous. We just, we can't, you know, I always say to, what I always say to my kids as I was raising them, you know, if you ever struggle with what to do with your life, go to the one who created you. He's the one who wrote the handbook on you personally. You need to have communication with him. And that's an ongoing, lifelong thing. But do that. that that's your root right there. Um, they, they have felt the temptations of the world as well as they've talked with me. You know, they, they understand the struggles with this relativistic idea that we don't have to have this relationship with God. Some of their friends seem happy. Some of their friends are making a little bit of money or they seem, they seem joyful because they're doing things that they want to do. You know, they're doing it their way. My you know, Frank Sinatra. Yeah, my way. Um, that was really good. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank good. you very much. Oh. Thank you. But, uh, but tell, me, tell me, you know, what, what do we say to parents who are right now thinking, yeah, that describes my kid. I had these conversations with them. Moral relativism. How do I deal with that? I've been telling parents for years, both in baptismal prep and from the altar, that you are in your family what I am in the parish. You know, among the duties that you have is you are the guard at the door. And mm. you need to know what your kids are consuming. You need to know what's coming in that door. Um, a lot of these parents, I, I mean, and we've been talking about this for decades, how first the TV and then the internet and the iPads and the smartphones have become babysitters. And as long as Junior's sitting there playing with these things, we're not checking what's, you know, what's on that screen and going into it. You know, it, one of the things I point out, you know, many times is that um, in multiple studies, for example, the first time that a young man comes into contact with hardcore pornography is 10 years old. Wow. Wow. The devil has been in the door a long time before parents are catching it. And so parents need to be monitoring. You know, I'm one of those that with my own parents, I'm like, there is no reason your child needs a sport phone. If they're under 18. Exactly. And things like TikTok, if you have the smart, they should not be on there because of what they're exposing your children to as normative behavior. Do you know what your children are watching in movies, what they're watching in TV, what they're listening to in music? Because the devil is very good at using these things to show a new sense of normative behavior. Right. The new normal. The new normal. And, yeah. and the media has embrace that new normal. And so part of it is um, for parents is you're the guard at the door. You're the person in the breach between your sheep and those who would prey on them. Now, the point of this book is to say to those that are in that you know, group of sheep, here's what to look for. Here, here's, you know, the book itself is written for 15 to 30. Yeah, I, I would not nice. give the book to a 10 year old um, specifically because the chapter on lust doesn't pull any punches. Sure. And it can't. Right. Uh, but from 15 on, I, I mean, these kids, for the most part, have been exposed. And even within the homeschooling community, I used to believe that, you know, there was kind of a barrier. But the devil just finds a way to get around it. And parents have to be cautious. And the kids need to know what a snake looks like and how to treat it. Mm. You know, before the show goes any longer, because this has popped in my head, I've been using that expression a lot lately. <laughs> it works well. But um, I'm going to buy a bunch of these books, uh, Father, and make sure they're readily available for young people and even for parents to give to their children. This sounds incredible and so timely and so necessary oh, yeah. right now. Do you have, can you tell us a little bit, uh, do you have like prescriptions uh, that you recommend for young oh, people? Oh, yeah. There's a whole chapter on the tools. So, nice. So, and it's early on in the book. And then 
I did what we did with Let Freedom Ring. I There's a, an appendix with various prayers. And then I took a number of prayers from Father Rippinger's book, delivered his prayers for a lady. I placed them in the back and then some of the prayers from the Auxilium Christianorum. Very good. Um, and then mentioned how the sacramental life of the church comes to play with this. Yep. The developing of virtue in counteracting each one of these sins. And then a large stress on humility. Because Good. humility gets us to see that we can't form an independent relationship or an independent identity outside of God that is fulfilling. And so if we go into life, you know, understanding that, yeah, then that helps with combating temptation. And now, Father, I know we, we talked before that we started recording here that um, there's been a little hiccup um, at the time we record this in getting this out there. Um, because printing companies, so this takes it a little bit different direction, but I do think there's a bit of a diabolical nature behind what's going exactly. on with our, our supply line and, and supply chains all over the world, and, and especially Canada, U.S. I mean, you're, you're having a hard time getting this book printed right now. I mean, it's in the process, but there, right. there's been some delay, right? Yeah, and part of it is supply chain issues, especially with paper, but it, it's like we keep coming up, up against one wall after another. And my publisher has been... Who would have thought? Yeah. Writing yeah, a book and, that says about spiritual warfare. Yeah. Who would have thought that? <laughs> I mean, he has been scrambling to find uh, to find paper, to help printer, or find printers, because he desperately wants the book out. He thinks there's something very special about this book. And, you know, from my vantage point, all I can do is pray and, you know, ask God to remove these obstacles yeah. because that's the only one's going to be able to do it well, like i say i think the timing is perfect too because um we've been especially embattled in the last two years mm -hmm. and you know a lot of these young people too a portion of them uh have faced you know things that have gone on in high school and universities and and all of that uh during this time and so there's just a sense out there that this isn't right this isn't usual uh, this is this seems demonic, and I think even the most uh, disconnected person from, you know, the divine life from faith uh, has to almost admit that 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 there's some kind of demonic surge going on right now in our times, and so I think people are searching. You know, they 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 want help uh, with this in these times, and and so you know I and. Again, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, sing your praises again, Father, but uh, if you've read anything from Father Bill Peckman, it is so engaging. You can't stop reading. It just He just has a very good gift. And uh, I have not read this book cover to cover yet. I've read portions that he's shared with me, but um, but uh, I can't wait to get my copy and and start reading because I know it's going to be profound uh and life-changing for a lot of people uh father you know uh as you look forward what what uh, first of all would you agree that these are especially demonic times that we're living in right now and and you know the time in the book is just right or uh, how do you feel about that i think that we are in particularly demonic times because we have become so detached from objective truth Right. And the authority that it brings. Yep. And once you take away objective truth, you take away God. Right. And so all you have left is whatever I feel today. And that's, you know, and I think those going through school right now, they're just seeing how unhinged that becomes and yeah. contradictions that come as a result. And I while think that's a good part of what we're... Before I forget, behind every good writer is an incredible editor. And um, my editor was just, I, I initially wrote a very academic book. <laughs> and, yeah. and it would have been great if you had had a Profound, but probably profound for me. Uh, but, but, yeah, yeah. I, what I know your editor that, very well. <laughs> and you know my editor. She's just incredible. Yep. Was able she's helping to, me with my book right now, too. Yeah. And, and she's, just, she, she did uh, incredible work on Let Freedom Ring. Do we speak her name out loud? Oh, why not? Carrie oh. Sherman. Carrie Sherman, just incredible. We should put her and picture up, Doug. He should. <laughs> He's incredible. 
and she taught me how to write to this age group. Um, yep. When I sent the first book, the first she's so uh, brilliant. Yeah, she is. She asked me a question. When you teach class, she teaches that age group. By the way, she teaches that age group. Yeah, yeah. But go ahead. And she asked me, "Is this how you teach this age group using this language?" I said, "Oh heavens, no! They wouldn't." And she said, "Okay, let's rewrite this to where <laughs> we're in the mark." I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> but I, I think that was one of those little God moments because, you know, I had kind of missed the, initially had missed the target audience. And I think, yeah. you know, if I looked at this book now, I'm like, oh my heavens, if I was 16, 17 years old, I'd pick up this book. Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, Carrie's brilliant and, and she does teach that age. So she knows how to speak to them and, and, uh, and, but, uh, I, I, and again, your first draft is amazing and I would have been <laughs> so engaged, but I get how Carrie caught that right. maybe not a 16 or 17 year old so much it would have been just a little bit, uh, they might've faded away a little bit <laughs> at yeah. some point. <laughs> there will be a workbook coming out with this nice. when I get a chance to write and it might be a couple months. I just, right now, the parish sure. is be busy. So then, Father, I mean, parents right now are wondering where to get this book. Uh, what, what is going to be our best way to, to get this in the hands of people? <laughs> we have three outlets right now, two outlets up and one coming um, soon and very soon. And I mean, probably next week, from, if I understand my editor right. So um, we do have it on Amazon and in Kindle form on Amazon because we've had a couple older people that said, Father, I, I, you know, I need something bigger print. And so there you go. Um, yeah. I That's can, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of people that are older because they weren't taught this stuff either. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, uh, then uh, Matra Media, um, the publisher, and then hopefully by next week we'll have it up on Roman Catholic Gear. Yeah, so that's my sister's store where my combat rosary is, and we thought it would be cool to have the book alongside of, you know, a combat rosary and stuff like that that they might want to pick up too. Yeah, it doesn't get more natural than that. Picking yeah. up, the, and I talk about the rosary and use of the rosary. Yep. Oh. Can, can so we'll, we'll have the links. Uh, we'll have we'll have the links when we publish this. Yes, it'll and, all uh, be in the description. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then, you have um, a Kindle too. That, that's good. Yeah. Could could both of you uh, share a little bit um, with our amazing audience who's watching and listening right now? Um some of the basics regarding especially authority this is something that you know i i mean i'm in my 50s and i was raised not knowing about the fact that i had a spiritual authority even over my own soul you right. know thus uh, thus the baptismal vows i reject satan and all of his empty promises i'm taking an authority right there but that i have a spiritual authority over my wife and over my children when they're living under my roof and so forth i mean speak just a little bit about that because i think that's a major part for a lot of parents is what do I do with my kids? Well, you have a spiritual authority over them, especially when they're living in your roof, under your roof and in your home by natural law and God and God's law. You can do things and engage in that spiritual battle by by binding demons and so forth. But but I know, and I also know this. I'll just throw this out, and then you can both jump into this. That sometimes women, God bless them, some of the holiest Christian women out there in the world will. I think unknowingly usurp the authority of their husband by stepping up almost in a way that, that kind of claims something in the house rather than praying for him, knowing that he has the final say so of that spiritual leadership in the house. But just that general authority structure is so important in spiritual battle. I will start off. This is a huge button with me. Mm. And I, again, it's one of those things in spirit in when I do uh, baptismal prep and from the pulpit, I will single out dads. I will say, the scriptures say you are the spiritual head of home. It doesn't say you should be. It says you are. And you are responsible for the upbringing of your um, spouse and your children in the ways of the faith. You have that authority. And you're answerable for that authority. Um, and again, it goes back to that idea that you're standing in that breach between your children, your family, and what would prey on them. And so everything from guarding what's coming into the house, praying for, leading your children and your wife in prayer. And I think a lot of times the wives 
step up because the husband has no interest in it. Right. I agree with that. I know a lot of times when I will give these homilies, I will see mm-hmm. wives start to elbow their husband in the yeah. You know, yeah. Are you listening? Are you listening? See, see, <laughs> see father's saying so. Um, yeah. But again, you know, it was never pushed. I, I mean, you think about how we train people for marriage and not just, you know, you know, after Vatican II, before Vatican II. I mean, there was just very little that was done. You love each other. Fine. Great. You know, we're good. But not talk. We don't talk about the goods of marriage. We don't talk about um the leadership roles within marriage. We don't talk about authority within marriage, you know, heaven for fen that we talk about, what is it, first, or Ephesians 6, you know, in, in the order of the family. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's funny, when that reading comes up, there's always, and this irritates me about the lectionary, there'll be an alternative, because, you know, heaven for fen that we should talk about it. And, you know, every time somebody will, some, someone will come in and say, okay, which, which reading we use on like Ephesians, because I'm going to talk about this. Um, it shows up also in, um, I think, the greatest tool the devil has right now in marriage, and that is cohabitation. Mm. You know, where do you ever hear anything about cohabitation? Right. We treat it as the norm. And if anything undercuts the authority of the husband is not to make him a husband at all. Yep. You know, to get yeah, you know what you know what back I was to say you know what backs up what you we're all saying here about dads especially is the studies that have been done and there was one that was done that that looked at um if the 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 mother the wife is strong in her faith and the father isn't the children are you know I don't have the statistics in front of you but they're very unlikely mm. to uh, uh, keep up with the faith uh, but if the father is strong in his faith, even if the wife isn't, the children are very likely to to yeah. keep the faith going. Yeah, and father, on one study that I saw on that, it's roughly when the mother is kind of that spiritual head and she establishes things, but the dad doesn't, it's in the ballpark of like 25 to 30% of the kids right. will be active in the faith. But when the father right. is, even if the mother's not, it's closer to 85 to 90%. That's correct. There's so much riding yeah. on the on on the the lifestyle, the choices, the dedication, the commitment of the father to the Catholic faith, the way right. he lives it, the way he prays, the way he the way he fasts and so forth. I mean, the demons fear a man who's doing his job, whether it's a priest for his parish or us husbands and fathers for our families. The demons fear it when we're out there doing our job because it follows the structure of authority that God has set up. And I just think that's that's powerful. You know, Father Peckman, I'm glad that it's a, it's a hot button for you because it, it is something that I've talked to so many people over 30 years of traveling and speaking on, on things kind of like this or, or this directly. And so many have come up and said, essentially, I have never in my life heard anything like this. And it's, it's a real, it's not just an eye opener. It's devastating for some of them because some women realize that they've been taking that authority on and you're right i mean if the father drops the ball completely she's got to do something but in general father so when you i'm curious what the reaction is when you give these talks and you're this clear with them with with uh you know whether it's marriage formation uh marriage prep or whether it's baptism formation and so forth how do they respond when you hit them with these these facts these truths during the actual homily or class um generally the man's head is kind of bowed mm. um because he's not going to fight me because he knows I'm right. <laughs> but um, he's not going to make eye contact either. Right. But what I do see, I would say 75% of the time, I start seeing the family at Mass regularly. I start seeing the dad at Mass. If I can get them there, the rest of it will follow through. Mm. But um, I start seeing them at Mass, and I start seeing the kids more participating, you know, especially if they're kids in our school. Mm-hmm. Um, if their kids are in our school, we start seeing, how should I say, better behavior. Hmm. Because now the their behavior at the school isn't mom's purview, it's dad's. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with the mom. It's just that, you, you know how it is, wait till your dad gets home, you know, kind of thing. Oh, yeah. 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 And so I, I see, in those two ways, I see differences um, almost immediately. And yeah, I reason- that 25% if Jesus Christ came down again and 
stood in the pulpit and said the same thing I did, they still wouldn't do it. So, Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I know recently there was a, a story, I think it was a school in Louisiana, a high school that had, this was within the last month, month and a half, several days of major fighting and violence. It was just like going on day after day after day. 23 students had been arrested. Just it was a real, just a rash of serious violence. Fathers started to come to school and they would have like groups of seven, eight dads just walk in the hallways and they were wearing t-shirts that I forget what the name of the group was, but they were just walking the hallways. And this was just the presence of fathers. Their sons and daughters were in the school and they were just making their presence known. And almost all of this violence just stopped almost immediately because the men were on the grounds. They were unified and they were starting to form more groups like this for other places in the country. It was just, it was just a natural, just a natural and divinely inspired divine structure of authority that just them being there and, and, and calling out the kids to be on time for class. Hey, don't be late. Get to class now. They joke around with them a little and some of the clips they showed from the news program, but they were just present there. And I think, I mean, a lot of that sounds like what you're saying, just to be present, to be establishing your role. And there is a natural kind of falling into line with this. And I, I would say to parents out there, don't expect this is going to be perfect. It's not an immediately turn, immediate turnaround. And the devil will push back. I mean, wh what would either of you two priests say to that, that the demons will push back when the authority structure in the family tries to step up, do its right thing, and help these young Catholics, young people get more active in the faith and all? Is there, is there a pushback? Is there a retaliation from the enemy? It's always a good sign if you're getting a pushback from the enemy. Mm. Mm. Like, like what Father's going through with his book. <laughs> That's yeah. a good sign, Father. <clears throat> when you're making the, met, the enemy, when you're making the devil mad, you know, and we get that too from his minions when uh, we start strength, uh, speaking truth in, in a time where, you know, they want to establish all these new normals and and lie and and uh, and try to uh, uh, you know just uh, change the culture completely, and we mm -hmm. we stand well. We get we, we get attacked in a lot of different ways. The devil uh, doesn't like that, and so yeah, there's always pushback, but we have to keep um, our eyes fixed on Jesus, and we have to keep uh, our disciplines of our faith uh, strong, and uh, we can we can uh, face the storm. So you're facing the storms. Uh, Father, how are, how are you doing with that? I have, for a long time, have been doing the um, first thing in the morning before I do office, the auxiliary Christian norm prayers. Good for you. In Latin, because the devil hates Latin. Mm -hmm. Good for you. So, um, Amen. You might inspire me Latin. there, Father. I did not know that. And what I will tell people is you've got to gear up. You don't go onto a battlefield without your armies. And yes, the devil is going to push back. And you should see that as a positive sign. You've got his attention. Nice. And you push back. We know who wins the war. Yeah. And we know who has the true power. And so it's not cowering in fear. It's like, oh, I'm getting pushed back. And it's like, okay, right. well, then sally forth. You know, it's, there's a great story. I, I've always wondered where this um, line came from. And it comes from the Civil War. Um, Admiral Farragut was um, invading Mobile, Alabama, and when the um, Northern, Ar Northern Navy came into Mobile Bay, there were all kinds of little mines and things in Mobile Bay, and it was there basically to keep them from, you know, forging into Mobile, and the famous line was, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, mm. and that's the attitude you got to take, you know. Yeah. Those minds are going to be there. We know who wins full speed ahead. Wow. You know, yeah, one, of the things I, one of the things I wanted to make sure we hit too is the fact that in our times, um, the, the whole uh, Satanism, witchcraft and all that has been popularized. I mean, we got to a point where a halftime show at the Super Bowl, what, what form of, of Satanism mm -hmm. are they going to do this time? You know, mm -hmm. and uh I, I talked with someone too who lived in Washington, D.C. and was kind of in the know, you know, kind of intelligence and all that. And they said, Father, uh, Satanism is uh, pretty common there. 
and it is all over. But but for the youth, you know, they look up to these uh, their idols, their stars, and so if they're they're sticking their tongue out, you know, down to their chest, and and uh, there's fire going on all around them, and you know, the, the, these satan satanic images, it starts to get popularized. And if you talk with exorcists, it is epidemic uh, among young people. Uh, Satanism. I remember doing my CPE, my clinical pastoral education, and I went to a certain place. I'll leave nameless, nameless. But uh, I wasn't there for, for for a few weeks when they invited me to their uh, Wiccan uh, meeting that they had, and a, a bunch of the staff was into witchcraft. And I, of course, that was the first time I ever heard of it uh, back then. But but the point I'm trying to make though is it, it you know it is replete in our culture right now and young people are because again they look up to their their heroes uh are are getting into it would, would you say that father yeah I, I mean satanism is basically the religion of subjectivism you know because satan cares not for the truth so allowing yourself to make up your truth and being given a religion, so to speak, that allows you to make up your truth and codify it and adopt morality that is, you know, with it. Right. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, how do you refuse? Especially right. if you've never been taught that there's anything else. Um, so it's a natural progression in this culture. Right. Um. It's, it's diabolical because Satanism on its surface presents itself kind of like a parlor game. You know, Ant and LaVey would say that we don't believe in Satan as a person. This is about, you know, the full independence of humanity from, you know, religion and God and that we're secular humanists. And basically kind of wrapped up Satanism into basically this parlor game with, you know, arcane rituals and such that were quote unquote harmless. Well, we know that, you know, the devil's never going to come in, you know, horns and a red cape and be true about who he is. Unless it's a Super Bowl halftime show. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, even then that's the parlor game mentality, you know? Yeah. yeah. But they don't know what they're messing with. I mean, you talk to exorcists and they always say that a lot of times the moment where the possession takes place is people playing with Ouija boards, tarot cards, and the right. occult. And they invite in something that, you know, I'm your grandmother or, you know, that's in heaven. And by the time it's done, it's too late. Mm. And so since we have really made satanism a a parlor game which is why i think people nobody's believes he's there you know it's kind of like this mythological figure from slasher films and you know video games right and i think that's how the set the satan would like to project himself yeah, yeah. and for those who who aren't familiar you mentioned anton LeBay. he's he wrote the uh, satanic bible so in general, when parents do get the pushback, I like that statement, damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead. We still have to have the attitude. Um, we can't stop. We've got to keep moving forward with the prayers, with the, with the fasting, with the, with the spiritual warfare, because it is real. And backing off because you're feeling some pushback um, is not going to solve the problem. It's only going to exacerbate the problem, make it worse. Is that, is that a fair way of looking at it? That's a fair way of looking at it. And again, to the power of parents, I remember what I was 12 or 13. And I can't remember what song it was. My sister and I were singing it. And it was a horrible song. And my dad stopped the car, turned around to us and said, don't you ever sing those words again. They are hmm. not good. They're evil. And both my sister and I, our eyes went like pie plates. That it, you know, it was like one of those things that dad heard. It was like, oh my heavens, my kids are hearing this and singing it. You know, yeah. no. Yeah. You know, kind of that idea of understanding this isn't good, and my my job is to protect my kids from this. And you know, Father, the fact that that is so prominent in your life that you bring it up right now, I mean, it, you know, so many years later that that would stand out is really a testimony to when when the when the head of the home or 
a priest that like yourselves from the pulpit says something so clear and so on par with the truth, it leaves a resonating response. And I just want to encourage anybody out there. Don't, don't think that it's got to always be done in a nice quote unquote way, because that does not necessarily mean truthful or charitable. Sometimes it's got to be done with a little bit of table flipping and a little bit of, uh, you know, make the, make the whip out of the cords and drive the animals out. You know, I mean, it's it, it, the best examples we have are Christ himself and the greatest man ever born of a woman. You know, John the Baptist both said some very clear, and some would say politically un- incorrect and just uh, cancel culture worthy statements. But it, it, it has to be done sometimes, especially when you're dealing with an enemy as, as twisted and as conniving as the devil. And to that, I, I've heard parents say this before, and especially when a parent is homeschooling and they're getting challenged by their friends. I will hear this statement or something akin to it, and I'm sure Father Heilman's heard it also. Why are you doing this? You can't protect your child forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if there was ever a diabolical statement there. Yeah, that, right. Yeah. Exactly. Your job to protect your child. Yeah. Exactly. You know, for heaven's sakes, you know. It, it drives and, you me know, out of my ear. I, and I, I brought up too Satanism. <clears throat> I want to make sure that people don't get the impression, okay, my kid's not doing satanic rituals, so this doesn't apply to me. No, 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 no. <clears throat> Satan is trying to manipulate us at all times and uh, in, in all kinds of diabolical ways. You don't have to be a Satan worshiper to be manipulated by Satan. And, you know, I, I so appreciate, Father Bill, that you said yes to the Holy Spirit on this project and and uh and and you're given some some really strong advice and teaching that uh is really going to help uh people to um you know stay uh stave off the 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 uh the attacks of the devil but just the manipulation i use that term a lot um the devil is manipulating easily manipulating a lot of people and that's because of how disconnected they are from from the divine life. The, the, and once you're, you know, it's a garden of Eden or not, you know, once you're away from the garden of Eden, once you're out of God's presence, then you're in the devil's presence and he has an easy time with you. And so we have to, we have to know that and we have to be prepared and we got to know what to do. And I think that's what this book is all about. Wouldn't you say father? Yeah. I'd like to go one step further and talk to the brother priests that are watching. Good. Because, you know, we can lay it on the dads and the families, but a lot of times the dads don't talk about it because we don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And you can't see them. There are two pictures behind me. Um, one is Da Vinci's uh, portrait of John the Baptist. And the other is Albert Burr's, um The Seven Lampstands. And there's a lot of times I look at that and I'm just like, I'm the one in charge of the lampstand in, in these parishes. Yep. What would be God's response to how you know, I am preparing the people that he's put under me for the spiritual life and for spiritual warfare. Right. And, and you're going to say things <clears throat> that the devil, <clears throat> excuse me, that the devil, <clears throat> and, excuse me, and those he's manipulating don't like. And you're going to be accused of being divisive because of that. But frankly, you got John the Baptist behind you. That's my guy. I said, I share his birthday. Uh, he was very divisive and, and, and he uh, made the authorities, the powers that be the government so mad that they took his head off, you know? So, um, but you know, we, we've, we've got to speak truth to power and, and this, uh, anytime there was, it, it's right now. And so again, um, thank you so much for, you know, choosing to say yes to the Holy spirit on this. Any last words, Father? We're getting closer to time. Any, any way you want to finish t- tonight? Nothing actually comes to mind. I think we, <laughs> we have covered everything. I think we did, actually. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, again, I really appreciate it. And it was, it was really fun working on our Let Freedom Ring book together. And uh, I think it's done a lot of good for a lot of people. And I'm very, very hopeful. And I can't wait uh, to see the good that this book does for a lot of people. Doug, any last words for you? Yeah, I just want to encourage parents out there, you know, don't lose hope. 
when it comes to this. And I don't care if all, if all of your kids have left the faith and they're living in a relativistic lifestyle. God's mercy is unending. It is beyond our comprehension. Uh, Prodigal Son is one of those stories that just really reminds us that when the child recognizes, you know what, I got to turn around, we just have to be ready to, to help them, you know, come back to God's mercy. Just uh, my mom always said to me, Doug, no matter what, remember, you can always go to confession. She told me that when yep. I was a small child, just, you can always Good go mom. to a priest in confession. Yeah. And that's just one of those reminders. And, you know, we know that we got struggles out there with the church and, and different this and that, but the sacrament of confession is still so powerful and I would just remind people this, that exorcists have even said that one, just one holy sacrament of confession where you're truly contrite, you're truly, you know, you express all your mortal sins. You're going to, you're going to open this up. You're going to receive that mercy. You're going to do your penance and you're going to try to amend your life. That is more powerful than, than what a dozen or a hundred exorcisms. I think the exorcists have said, you know, when we of our own free will walk into that confessional and say, I got to humbly admit, I need yep. God's help. That yep. is powerful because the devil is screaming, ah, yep. you know, someone's doing this of their own free will. So, and, and to that point, to the parents that are out there listening right now, you know, you couldn't be more correct. Don't give up. Keep pressing on because this book was written by someone who fell away from the church and embraced agnosticism in his, night, in his teens and 20s. Wow. So, if you know, I, I you know, and I really laid these on my grandmother's prayers. And, you know, mm. she brought me back to the church and back into the seminary. Don't give up. Don't write them off. Don't think they've gone so far that they can't come back. Right, right. That's awesome, Father. Awesome, Father. Could you uh, uh, cl help us with uh, closing prayer and blessing? Sure. In the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now, and in the Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Father. You're welcome. You, Father, appreciate it. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.